Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Game Theater Com video, we're going to be discussing tech news which has popped up as usual over the past 24 or so hours, and also doing an analysis of sorts on NVIDIA's Volta architecture because some information has popped up on the Tensor cores as well as an inside look at the actual successor to Pascal. So we'll go through that at the end of this video, but we're going to be starting things out with Intel and the i3-8350K because this CPU looks to be a very impressive for gamers who are on a budget. So we have a CPU Z benchmark with uh, version 1.8. Quick aside, many of you might be aware that version 1.8 actually changes the way benchmarks are handled. So in short, Results of like, let's say 1.79 are not even somewhat comparable to 1.8. Basically, the scores are completely and utterly different. But getting back into the news itself, starting things out with the 8350K, non overclocked, it's 4 gigahertz, 4 cores, 4 threads, just your information. You're looking at a single thread performance of 503 compared to 1982 for multi thread. That's very good. That's very good scaling on multi thread performance. But Here's the kicker. That's about 10 points higher in single thread performance than a 7700K. And to put it into context, it's around yeah, about 650 points slower in multi thread performance. So, yes, it is slower than the, than the 7700K, but consider the price difference of these two processors when they launch. And you can certainly not be too harsh on the 8350K. In fact, the 6700K is even closer. You're looking at mm, about the 400 point difference on multi-thread score and about 28 points difference in single thread performance. So that is very close indeed. In fact, this CPU could be very impressive for folks wanting to build, let's say, a small form factor PC or perhaps a system to take with them to their friends or gaming conventions, that type of thing. Assuming this CPU comes in at a decent price point, obviously we don't know what it's going to cost yet, but let's say 150 to 200 ish US dollars, I can certainly see many people wanting to jump on this processor. Now, obviously, we can't do an exact like for like comparison um, across systems because we don't have the CPU in our in our uh, suite right now, so we can't you know start testing it, and we can't obviously make sure that the memory is identical and the clock speeds are. You know, perfect and that type of thing. But if you were to take a look at, like, say, AMD's Ryzen 3 1200, you can see single thread performance is about 440 to 480. Um, once again, using CPU Z 1.8, whereas multi thread performance is about 1750 to maybe 1800. I say about because, once again, of course, this does depend on memory timings, clock speeds. Um, if you've decided to overclock your processor, the motherboard, and well, just whether you've decided to sacrifice a goat that morning to the CPU Z gods. Of course, the Ryzen 3 1200 is considerably cheaper. It's only around 100 Great British Pounds, so there is that to take into consideration. But it's very hard to argue with Intel's processors at the moment. I'm not saying they're going to be completely and utterly destroying Ryzen across the board. I don't think that's going to be the case. But I am very thankful that Intel are finally moving away from this whole 4-core, four 4-thread four or 4-core, 8-thread at the high end of their mainstream processors. In other words, like the 6700 or the 7700K. The only slight issue I have with these processors, and by slight I mean quite big, but... It is what it is. It's, of course, the fact that it's not backwardly compatible with the 200 series boards. I don't know the reason why that is, um, especially since there is a lot of similarities, and that's being generous, between the um, Z370 boards and their predecessors. The only thing I can think of is power distribution or possibly something else, but whether that's going to be the case, I'm curious to see whether someone is going to just take the BIOS of one of these boards, start checking it, and then basically make a tweak and then make it so that the 300 series boards are not needed and you can run a, let's say, 8700K on the previous motherboards, let's say the Z370, uh, sorry, 270. That would be very cool, but it is what it is. I suspect that AMD is still going to win in single thread, I'm uh, sorry, in multi thread tasks in some instances, and they probably will have the price advantage as well. 
So there is definitely that to take into consideration. Plus the fact that obviously with AM4, you know that you're going to be able to slot in the next generation of Ryzen processors as well. And I suspect for many, that's certainly going to be something that you're taking into consideration when you're buying the processor. Very small piece of Intel news. Uh, it's going to be a very quick thing. And that is that we're seeing the 12 core 7920X up to the 18 core 7980XE, which is of course the Extreme Edition processor, finally start having their um, cells available for pre-order and of course purchase. I won't list out all the stores where you can purchase these, but for example, Overclockers UK have them at around the £1,799 mark. I say around because sometimes there will be some uh, early adopter incentives or price gouging from certain retailers, but Obviously, this is very expensive for a CPU. I'm not saying that this is like a great choice if you're just doing gaming or whatever, but hey, some people just need this level of performance, especially if you're doing something like 3D modeling while wanting to also, let's say, export high um, fidelity video, let's say 4K, plus perhaps doing something else in the background, or perhaps even a lot of virtual machine work, then obviously more cores is a good thing. I still maintain, however, that for the average person who just needs an awful lot of cores, a Ryzen 7 is probably the way to go, or maybe even Threadripper if you do need those additional cores, but you don't need to cough up that extra price. But with that said, I do like the Skrillex X platform, and I do stand by my review. Uh, which of course I conducted using the 7900X. Uh, so, with Hotchips conference going on, or rather gone on, we have quite a lot of information on a lot of chips and a lot of uh, other technologies which are popping up. As I said, there is supposedly going to be the entire set of uh, slides and other bits and bobs being released for the Xbox One X Scorpio engine, but numerous websites, including Serve the Home, Tom's Hardware, Anantech, and a few others have uploaded some of the images and slides for the um, Volta-based GV100, which is looking to be an absolute monster. Now, this chip has four stacks of HBM2 memory, so that's 16 gigabytes total. Now, the die itself is huge. When I say huge, I mean monstrous. We're looking at 815 mm squared, which just... To put into some context, has 21 billion transistors. That's on a 12nm process. That is absolutely ridiculous in terms of engineering. Engineering, excuse me, feat. Now there are 5,120 CUDA cores uh, plonked onto this thing, and that is, of course, split across 80 SMs. But what is nice is that Nvidia have actually manufactured this with 84. As you can probably imagine, this is to maximise yields, because let's face it, if they were to only have 80 SMs, well, you can imagine that yields would be pretty terrible. If they had, you know, 84, which of course they do, the chance of one or two of those being unusable, being damaged in manufacturing is, well, you know, possible, but having four or more damaged is not very likely at all. We also see the GV100 with an absolute massive increase over Pascal. Uh, you can see it on yourself, uh, yourself on screen, but for one, you have considerably more memory bandwidth. If you're looking at 900 gigabytes per second, which is about 20% increase. You have an awful lot more bandwidth when it comes to NVLink, almost twice the performance. Level 2 cache is increased by 1.5 times, and level 1 caches are absolutely monstrously increased by a factor of 7.7 .7 times. Perhaps the most obvious change though is raw throughput. So when it comes to deep learning training, for example, you have 120 T-flops of performance. This is a 12 times increase. Or if you prefer FP32 for the sake of argument, you're looking at 15 teraflops versus just 10 of Pascal. Now we'll get into why DL training has had such a major increase in just a second hint, tensor cores, but let's just go through the rest of the specifications and other bits and bobs first. There are some inherent differences on the actual SMs themselves. They have twice the number of schedulers and also, as I just mentioned, a larger, faster level 1 cache. Plus, believe it or not, this is 
in conjunction with a 50% increase in energy efficiency compared to a uh, Pascal SM. Just taking a look at, for example, level one and shared memory cache, you have four times the bandwidth of the streaming L1 versus, once again, Pascal and four times the capacity. In other words, this thing is absolutely monstrous. And in terms of raw throughput, it's going to just be night and day difference if you're doing something like deep learning. This is all combined with higher clock frequencies as well. Now, I have to admit, one of the weirder additions, at least if you're not too familiar with the technology, happens to be the tensor cores, which I'm going to discuss just in a moment. But there is also one other thing I forgot to add, and that is that unlike Pascal, and this is according to NVIDIA's own blogs, by the way, which could not execute an FP32 and an integer 32 instruction simultaneously, Volta allows this. So, in essence, and I'll read this verbatim, allows simultaneous executions of FP32 and integer 32 operations at full throughput, while also increasing instruction issue throughput. Dependent instruction issue latency is also reduced for core FMA math operations requiring only four clock cycles on Volta compared to two, six on Pascal. So a little bit of background before we start getting into the actual tensor um, processes, I guess, first, and that is that a tensor is a mathematical object. It's basically an array of components, and they are functions, coordinates of space. Now, Google actually created its own machine learning framework, and it uses tensors because tensors are basically very scalable, especially when it comes to deep learning, neural networks, that type of thing. In other words, things that unsurprisingly NVIDIA have quite a few fingers in those pies. Now, one thing that Google did, which was probably very smart of them, was that it decided to open source this technology known as open, sorry, TensorFlow machine learning. While the full explanation of this is well outside the remit of this video, the too long didn't read is that now we have the ability, well, more specifically, Tensor has the ability to provide mixed precision uh, FP16 and 32 cores. Now, what this means in reality is that you have up to 12 times the performance of FP32 operations, at least in comparison to Pascal, six times the performance of Pascal's FP16 operations. Now, there are 640 tensor cores in the V100, that's eight tensor cores for each SM. All of this means that Volta is an incredibly, incredibly powerful uh, GPU. And obviously it's really going to find itself at home with deep learning on other such usages. But as you can imagine, gamers are also very interested in this. Unfortunately, as Jensen himself said, it's very expensive to produce these, and just prohibitively so, especially this year. So, for the gamers, I don't think you're going to be getting this thing over the next, you know, six months. In fact, Jensen himself has said that he doesn't predict it's going to be available until, you know, at least next year. What does that mean for gamers? Well, unfortunately, if you're an NVIDIA fan and you want a graphics card, and you have a set budget, whatever your budget may be. Let's say you can afford to buy like a GTX 1080. I'm going to say just buy one. The very worst that I can predict to happen if you're an NVIDIA fan, and by a fan, it could just be that you're involved or you have, you know, already grabbed yourself a G-Sync monitor. Let's say you've got a GTX 10, uh, 970 right now. So, of course, you've, you know, embedded yourself in the NVIDIA ecosystem, which is fine. Then... I would say just buy a GTX 1080 because the very worst that can happen is a Pascal refresh this year. And I wouldn't be surprised if that possibly happens. It might occur. I mean, this is a prediction. This is a theory. I'm not saying it's going to happen because this is not like an industry rumor per se. There were very early rumors, like I think earlier this year, that we're going to see a Pascal refresh and then they've just completely died, uh, died down. The only thing I can think of is we're going to see one of two scenarios. One, we're just going to be stuck on this particular Pascal architecture for the next, I don't know, 6, 12 months until Volta becomes cheaper. Perhaps we're going to see, H it, perhaps it's going to be shrunk down. Perhaps the, the memory um, controllers are going to be changed around as well. So we're going to see it support, let's say, GDR5X, possibly uh, R5 or maybe even R6, depending on the direction and the performance of the particular GPU in question. Or 
we'll probably see, yes, a Pascal refresh, but what that would mean, maybe a slightly shrunk process, possibly slightly higher clock speeds, maybe. So, I don't know, maybe a slightly larger number of CUDA cores per GPU, but I don't know. I don't know if NVIDIA would bother to do that, because let's say they were to release this, I mean, currently, obviously, it's August, it's late August, they are probably not going to release it December time, because it's way too late to make any real difference to their Q4 uh, earnings. So really, they've got until November-ish, or possibly early next year. So really, there's one month that's not going to be released. In theory, obviously, I could be wrong. It could be, like, uh, you know, released on the 15th of December. But really, realistically, it's going to be, you know, until, let's say, early November, maybe mid-November this year for them to release that. Or, as I said, they're going to miss the earnings window, really, for it to make a big difference in this quarter. And, of course, next year... Uh, if they release it too late, let's say, I don't know, January uh, January's fine, February's probably fine, but March starting to push it because by that point it's possible that we won't have to wait too long for Volta. But with all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.